Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains. That's in Missouri, in the USA. Well, it's that time again. It's Ferengi Friday, where we have a look at the recent things that have made their way into the shop, the recent acquisitions, if you will. Let's start out with what's in this black bag right here, and don't let the Tandy sticker fool you. This is a very rare old laptop. Let's have a look. Here are just a few of the circuit boards I've had made recently by PCBWay who is nice enough to sponsor this video. So whether you need a few boards or a lot of boards, check out PCBWay. So head on over to PCBWay and get your instant quote on standard circuit boards, flex circuit boards, assembly, and they now also offer rapid prototyping so you can get your mechanical parts made as well. That's an awesome service. So for your next project, head on over to PCBWay. As you can guess by the size of this bag, what's in here is pretty big and it's pretty heavy. Let me tell you, it is about 17 pounds. And this weighs a little more because we have all the manuals and the power supply and this big aluminum enclosure here. Oh. Gosh, it's heavy. You can just see there, this is a K-Pro 2000 Plus. Let's get it out of this bag. Well, I've really had my workout for today, just getting this thing out of the bag. Now, some people call this Darth Vader's laptop, and I guess you can see why. And it's really an interesting beast. Now, as you know, K-Pro started uh, selling CPM machines, but this is actually a DOS machine. It's got catches on the sides, and we can open it up here. We are catching on something in the back here. And we've got a full-size keyboard, a big LCD screen. This is actually a Super Twist LCD. It looks really nice. The original K-Pro 2000, not the Plus, had a real tiny screen, like the size of a TRS-80 Model 100 in the middle here. And a few years later, they came out with this Plus. The keyboard detaches, it has two floppy drives, it had the option of a hard drive inside. It was quite the machine back in the early to mid 1980s. I'll be doing several episodes on this beast, and we'll get it back into fighting shape and get it all booting up and everything. I just had to show it to you right away because it's such a cool computer, and it was a very kind donation. Go ahead and close the lid here. We'll take a quick peek around the outside. There we go. There is one floppy drive. Some of the connectors. More connectors on the back. Second floppy drive, more connectors, and even an expansion port. This has a serial number of 437362. I don't know how many they made. And believe it or not, this does not run on NICAD batteries. It runs on lead acid batteries. No, I am not kidding. So, look for this beast in an upcoming episode or three or four. Let's see what else we've got to look at today. A few weeks ago, I was perusing the Facebook marketplace and I saw somebody somewhat near me, you know, within 100 miles, which is close for here, uh, listed some Atari books for sale. And I contacted them and I found out they actually had more than one set. And I got to chatting with them and I offered to buy the whole lot. This is part of them right here. In total, it was about 39 pounds of books. He was nice enough to ship them to me. There's this one odd K-Pro book right here. But uh, most of the rest is Atari. There's Atari programming books, operation books, some stuff for peripherals, compute books on graphics and things like that. 
some more peripheral books here. Uh, there's an odd Intel book over here, some stuff on BASIC, Leventhal 6502 book, and advanced programming techniques for the Atari. All very nice stuff. Now, most of this you're going to find PDFs of online, but it's such a treat to be able to get the physical books. I have a young niece that once said that she loved books because it was a better user interface, and I have to agree with her. Books are a much better user interface than a computer screen for reading. So let's look at the second half of the books now. Here is the second half of the stuff. You see over here we have some miscellaneous DOS and even a Heathkit book. There are two books that actually on microprocessors. Then we get into some actual Atari uh, technical reference notes and copies of manuals and things like that. That's what this whole stack here is too. And over here we have some books on Atari. I thought maybe this was a copy at first, but it's just actually been put in a binder. This is actually a printed cardboard cover and slick magazine-like sheets. So I'm wondering if this was like a, a limited printing of this book. I've never heard of it before. Maybe some of you have. But having all this original service documentation is great. Uh, the fellow I bought this from had acquired it from an estate sale from somebody he thought may have serviced Ataris in the past. And after I got to talk to him more about picking up these books, I said, you know, hey, if you ever come across any more vintage computer stuff, keep me in mind. And he said, well, actually, I bought a bunch of Atari computers at the same sale. Would you be interested? And I said, well, sure, probably. And uh, we talked and we wind up striking a deal. Now, he was asking reasonable prices and uh, was an easy fellow to deal with. So it was a, an easy deal to make. And I was very happy to be able to pick this stuff up. Let's have a look at the computers now. Here are the contents of box number one of the Atari goodies. Let's go through these in a little more detail. Okay, first just here we have the Atari 810 single floppy disk drive and while this thing is huge it's actually lighter than a 1541. It's like we used to have at my high school and I've actually worked on these before although it's been a long time ago. And here this trio we have a couple 410 data sets and in the back here is just there is a 1020 printer plotter. Now that uses the same ALPS mechanism as the Commodore 1520 and lots of other stuff. And since we have the pinion gears available now, be able to get that to work, I think. Now here we have some input devices. I was really puzzled by what these four button controllers were until I found this box. It is actually a four player game with four individual inputs. It's kind of interesting. The box says it's for Commodore or Atari, so I'll have to try that out. The controllers have RJ11 connections, so there must be a junction box of some kind with the game that they plug into. And of course, we've got a couple Koala pads there and the Koala pad software as well. Let's take a look in the next box now. Here we have box number two. Uh, this is all sorts of flyers like this, like things you may have found in an Atari dealer, which I find kind of interesting. There's some manuals and guides and things like that in there. So I'm wondering if this person worked for an Atari dealer. There's some Atari Basic books, an Atari Raider box, some SIO cables and RF switch boxes, things like that. Some random disc and a cassette. A few Atari power adapters here. 
And the thing on the Atari power adapters is they're just basically a transformer in a box. So there's nothing really in there to go wrong like there is with the Commodore power bricks. So these are probably all still just fine. Now here we have three different CX-85s, which is a keypad. Here we go. It is a keypad that plugs into the joystick port. Now, I don't remember exactly on these, but I think you had to have a special driver type program to make these work since they plugged into the joystick port. We'll have to try that out. Now, if I've not lost my count, this is box number three, and this is one of miscellaneous stuff that he just threw in. He didn't know if it was even worth selling. But there is a box of cassettes, and these all seem to be like homemade cassettes, nothing commercial. A busted up uh, 410 cassette deck. Some uh, RF switch boxes, a couple of them in the box. A few more power supplies. Three sets of Atari basic cartridges. Oops, you can't see that, can you? Let's scroll this way. There we go. So we have the RF switch boxes, the power supplies. There's a, two of them in there. Three uh, Atari basic cartridges in a box. And an oddball. A Timex Sinclair 1000 Super Math tape that requires a 16K extension. Inside this pill bottle, it says BROM. And there's three chips. Not sure what these are. The pins are all kind of bent up. This one says ICD. And the pins are all bent up, but they're there, so we may have to do some research into this and see what these guys are. Then over here we've got a bag of SIO cables, a wall wart, miscellaneous cables. Those are always great to find miscellaneous bags of stuff like that. Some disc organizers for five and a quarter inch discs, some miscellaneous cables, and some more documentation over there on the right. I think we might have to have a look in this busted 410 data set later. I found another piece of it here. So it looks like it may have got dropped or smacked somehow. So I'll have to have a look inside and see what's all there or see if it's been robbed for parts. Well, now we are down to the computers themselves. We have an 800XL in the box, which I have not taken out yet. And there are a pair of 400s, which both seem to be in fairly good shape. One is a little more yellow than the other. And I like the fact that somebody had a sense of humor. And they put a mini mainframe sticker on the one. So I don't know how many years it's been since these have been fired up. But it looks like they've been stored fairly decently. They're not really dirty. They don't smell too musty. So we'll have a look at them in an upcoming episode and see what's in there. Now, I have not looked in this 800XL box yet, so we're definitely going to look at this in more detail in a little bit. Look what I just found on the back of the 400 that has the mini mainframe sticker. It's a DB25 connector. And somebody's put that in there by hand. You can tell from the cutout, but they've done a really good job. Now I'm really curious what that's wired into. I wonder if this was a common mod back in the day. I don't remember seeing this before. If you guys have seen a mod like this on an Atari 400 or 800, let me know what it's for. We're definitely going to have to have a look at this in a future episode. Here is our last little bit of stuff. We have an Atari 800 in pretty good shape, a little dirty. It's a little more yellowed along this side, so that was probably toward a window. And it is missing the number one keycap. Now the fellow I bought these from said he found it and then lost track of it and he would send it to me if he came across it again. And we have one of these uh, AC power centers. 
I love these things. These were a really classic accessory back in the day, and they're still very handy for vintage systems to this day. What do you say we dig into detail into a few of the items? Maybe starting with this 800XL, because I've not even had it out of the box yet. Okay, here is our 800XL. It says, built-in Atari Basic programming language. Professional keyboard and function keys. Over 2,000 software programs available for word processing, business, education, and more. The box has been taped up in the past, and the tape is yellowed. But the box is still in okay shape. Even these upside down people seem to be happy about having an Atari. Let's see if we can coax our styrofoam out here. This is always nice and squeaky. Boy. I'm not sure which way's up, so I probably have it upside down. Um, no, that looks pretty decent. So, I think this is empty. It's the box for the TV switch. Yep, that was empty. But the box was still in there. A big Hulk and power supply. This outputs 5 volts DC at 1.5 amps. And that's it. Yep, that is a big stonking power supply. And of course we have our 800XL here. Wow, this looks like it's in really good shape. Still have the paperwork in there. What a treat. Here we go. still shiny too. See a few maybe like little scratch marks here from putting a cartridge in. Don't really see any wear or dirt on the keyboard. Got some dust bunnies hitching right on the bottom here. Very nice. Still got the cover on the parallel bus. I don't think this was actually used all that much. Well, this is quite a treat. I didn't realize that this 800XL was in such excellent shape. I don't guess I'm going to have to do much to this, but we'll get to this in a future episode and see how it works. Okay, here is our dilapidated 410. Somehow, broken and busted up stuff is just as much or more fun than brand new shiny looking stuff. I mean, be honest, would you rather walk through a new car dealership or a junkyard? I think I would rather walk through a junkyard. Okay, what do we have in here? Um, this is a busted piece. And that's most of that corner. There's still a little chunk missing. And there is a new old stock replacement belt. An official Atari Bart part for the counter. Wire nuts with electrical tape around there. I'm not sure if that's factory, but the last time I had one of these apart was in the 1980s. And, well, everything looks like it's in there. Uh, the drive belt is definitely shot. And we've got some sort of liquid damage here. And we're all busted up right here as well. This thing has had a knock. 
And, well, no, I thought that pause key was broken, but. Huh. I never noticed before it says advance instead of fast forward. Oh, well, mechanically, it's doing okay. It's just been knocked off a table or something like that. So, we might be able to save this guy yet. We're going to have to get the cords unwrapped. So we can kind of set it back down in there a little better. I know those other cassette decks were in better shape, but there's something really satisfying about taking something that was beaten up and battered and nursing it back to health. Even if it's never perfect again. Okay. Let's see if we can get these cords draped out of this enclosure correctly. Give it back a little bit of its original dignity. There we go. Yeah. There's no screws, but screws are easy to come by. What do you say? Should we try to revive this at some point in time? Let me know what you think. Just found one other thing here. This uh, power cord has a big bite out of it. I suspect that's the work of rodents. So it's going to need a new power cord. So here is our party quiz game that went along with our four controllers and this joystick Y cable thing. And it says here that includes general edition question disk for Commodore 64 and Atari computers with over 2,500 questions. See, all four of those people look so happy to be playing that. It's so obviously what you did back in the 1980s with your friends. You wore fancy sweaters and played video games in the living room. But look, look at the picture. This says Atari and Commodore 64. And what does that look like right there? That's an apple. False advertising. Let's see if we can figure out how to get this guy open. There we go. Oh my goodness, there are several discs in here. Lots of stuff. Ah. So, these are the player one through four stickers. You need to stick those on yourself. Program disc. This side, Atari computers. This side for Commodore 64. And it looks like it might still be okay. We'll have to try to image those. Question disc. This side for Commodore 64, this side for Atari. Program disc. Another program disc. Huh. It has a little gamer guide. Friendly offer from Suncom. Another question disc. That's odd. There's two sets of discs. Some type of warranty registration. Ah, oh, this is the junction box. Oh, I see your controllers plug in here. One, two, three, four. And this one is what this cable plugs into. And then this plugs into two joystick ports. Like that. Huh. And there's only a couple wires in each one of these RJ11 connectors. That's kind of curious, isn't it? So the controllers each have two wires. And this middle one has four wires. So what do you want to bet that these are nothing more than four buttons and a few resistors in there? 
Oh, that's strange. Those have one of those funky Canadian Robertson screws in there, the square head ones. Thank you, Canada, for the goofiest screw drive in the entire world. And another whole set of controllers. Well, now I'm confused. So maybe somebody had two of these at once and only one box survived. Hmm. Yeah, these don't look like they've ever been out of the box. Well, isn't that curious? Oh, and these still have the rubber feet on them, whereas these are all missing the rubber feet. Interesting. But somebody did put the stickers on these already. Huh. Well, what do you say we take one of these apart and see what's inside of it? Now I am curious. I did not have the right size Robertson screwdriver, but I've got a flat blade that'll work. Actually, these types of screws were a good idea. You know, the idea being that they won't slip like a Phillips screw will, so it'd be easier for production. They're just far less common. And you never seem to have the right size screwdriver. guy open. Ooh, got a slick blue piece of plastic here. Well, this must be the actual circuit boards because we've got some connectors kind of slid over there. Some more buttons. Some foamy stuff. And that's kind of glued down there so I'm not going to peel it all the way up. And some type of membrane or domed buttons. Yeah, so the buttons are kind of pushing down across here. Here, there's a little lump between it. So I'm guessing since we see this black here, this is like the printed on carbon. And it looks like all these buttons are in parallel like this. So you can think of this as sort of like, yeah, these are glued in the middle here. So I'm not going to see a little bit of glue here. I don't want to peel that up. Maybe we can look at it this way. There we go. Yeah. So all these sets of buttons are in parallel and this is like a carbon that's printed on the PCB to make up the resistors. And we just have our two wires out. So when we press a button we'll get a different resistance. So you Set your value of resistors so that if you have one or more pressed, you're going to have a unique value coming out. Think of it kind of like in, in binary, where each binary digit is worth a power of two more than the next one. Kind of do the same thing with resistors here, so you can measure the resistance and know which button's pressed. Very interesting. So I wonder if we pop this guy back in like so the leads on here and press a button yeah so about 82k without a button pressed that drops up by 20k yeah there it's 40k 20k yeah so basically each button is reducing it by another 20k hmm, very interesting so they made a very simple multi-button controller taking advantage of the joystick ports so maybe we'll do a video where we look at how you would read this in software that would be kind of interesting what do you think there's 
One more thing I wanted to take a look at that was in the box that was kind of interesting. Let's jump over to it now. And you remember we found this pill bottle full of chips that said BROM. And this says MPP 1100 chips. But when we looked inside, I found these guys and I put them on separate pieces of uh, in a static foam here and straighten up all the pins and I found this one first I looked this up this is actually an A series ROM out of an Atari not a B series even though there's a little piece of paper under here that says B ROM I reckon they took the B ROM and put it in the machine and saved the A ROM And these other two things kind of had me wondering for a while. You can see this big plastic module that says ICD. And then there's this chip. And after asking about this on Twitter, somebody said, well, ICD used to make all sorts of uh, Atari accessories and software like um, Spartados. And I was like, okay, there's a place to start searching. And then I found some post on Atari Age that seemed to indicate this was a RAM module that was a replacement for the 1050 disk drive. And I couldn't really get any hits on this part number, and so I posted on Atari Age, and somebody was nice enough to point out that right on here this says ICD, USD, so this is the US doubler ROM, which also goes in the, that disk drive. And, you know... If that had been a snake, it would have bit me because it said ICD right on there, but that's what this is. This is a US doubler ROM and uh, double the RAM for an Atari 1050 disk drive, which added some things. I think you could copy some more disk that way, and it made it faster. And then I got looking through all those manuals and stuff, and I found this Spartados book. So, yes, this is making sense now. And I found this US Doubler cardboard package. The inside of it's not there, but the package is. So, yes, that's what those are. Those are the chips that came with this package. And there was even an ICD uh, R Time manual here. So, very interesting. That solves that problem. And thanks for all the help from the folks on Twitter and Atari Age. For figuring out what this was. Well, thanks for joining me on this Ferengi Friday. It was nice to be able to sit down and have a look through all this stuff. I hadn't had a chance to go through it in detail, and it was nice to be able to share it with you. Look for all these items in upcoming episodes. We'll go through all the Satari stuff and refurbish it, and we'll also refurbish that nifty K-Pro laptop. If you have any questions or comments, well, leave them in the comments section down below. I would love to hear from you. And thanks to everyone who helps support the Haybert channel through Patreon and other means. It's greatly appreciated, and you keep this channel going. Well, until next time, bye.